Good evening. So glad to see all of you tonight. Happy you're able to be here. We're uh, studying in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 26. And we're just about uh, ready to look at the institution of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we left off at verse 25 last time. Before we enter into our study this evening, we want to begin with the word of prayer. We'll ask Brother Brody to direct our minds. Amen. All right. Uh, last time we were looking at uh, Jesus identifying uh, the one that was going to betray him, uh, and they are having the Passover meal. I thought we'd just read through the verses up to where we left off. It says, Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining at table with the twelve disciples. And as they, uh, they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, they each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dips his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. So narrows down you know, the group. And then the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. So... The Lord lets them know clearly beforehand the things that were going to happen that night, that Jesus would be betrayed by one of the twelve, and uh, one that uh, sat and ate with him, had his hands on the table there with them, and uh, he's going to act on his own free will, but it was all foretold and prophesied by God. So it's all going to happen, the suffering of Christ, according to what had been predicted and what had been foretold by God in the Old Testament. But yet each individual that has a part in his suffering and crucifixion and so on, they're responsible for the choices that they make. And Judas, it says it would be better since he is going to be lost, <laughs> that he had never been born. And then verse 25, only here in the book of Matthew do you have, uh, you know, it specifically where Judas just asks him straight out, is it, it's not I. <laughs> and Judas, who was betraying him, said, surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. So he communicates this in such a way we know from John's gospel that the other disciples didn't understand what he was talking about because he's going to tell Judas what you do, do quickly. And Judas got up from the table and went out. And the others thought he was going to buy some supplies for the Passover to give some money to the poor. Um, so this is a private conversation, but he identifies uh, he says straight to Judas, you, you, are, you are the one. It is you. Uh, what hypocrisy he knew that he was the betrayer. So he's just trying to keep up a, uh, a facade and uh, act like he's just like the other disciples in order to deceive. But Jesus knows what he's done and what he's going to do. And he says, uh, uh, it's as you said. And that's the same expression that's found when Pilate uh, says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you said it. <laughs> it's the idea, yes, I am. And he says, surely it's not I. And Jesus says, you said it, it is you. <laughs> you are the one. And you can see it expressed in the New International Version. They translate it, yes, it is you. To get that idea across, is that is what it means, that, that expression. So he g goes out and leaves the other disciples and then you have the institution of the Lord's Supper at the close of the Passover meal. And verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So here we have the Lord uh, instituting this meal even before he died that they're going to use to remember him by and what his uh, sacrifice was all about just like the Passover, you know, was a memorial that reminded people of God's deliverance of the people from the land of Egypt and how he passed over them and struck the firstborn of the Egyptians and they got that deliverance that night. Uh, in the age to come, people are going to take this uh, unleavened bread and remember Christ's body that gives us our deliverance from a greater captivity, the captivity to sin that we were all in. So he takes the bread and he, after a blessing, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, after giving thanks, 
So what does it mean to bless the food or <laughs> to bless the fruit of the vine? It's to give thanks for it. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's the way you, you bless your meal, is you thank God for the meal. It uh, sanctifies that food. And uh, we're told that we should do that any time that we have a meal, that w the things that we eat we should be thankful for and give God thanks for and ask His blessing upon it. And uh, all, all foods are clean to us if we uh, have them with thanksgiving for the things we have. Where in the Old Testament, you know, there's certain foods <laughs> you couldn't eat. So you couldn't eat pork, no bacon, no sausage, and all those good things <laughs> that we think of today. But with prayer, we're told in, in First Peter, if we'll pray for the things, it, it is acceptable. Um, so he gives thanks for the, for the bread. And it, it shows an example of what we should do when we're waiting on the Lord's table. A lot of times we talk about Jesus' death on the cross and his body and so on. But if you're following the pattern Jesus sets here, you first of all say, thank you. <laughs> thanks for this bread, right? That's what Jesus did. So it's a meal. It's a spiritual meal. It's got a spiritual meaning and all. But it's a meal that you give thanks for. So when you... Uh, are going to wait on the table and give a blessing for the bread. At, remember to give thanks for the bread. <laughs> and when you get to the cup, give thanks for the fruit of the vine. That, that's uh, what the Lord does. And uh, all of the other things that we say about it uh, are great too, but that's sort of an, an essential part to do. He broke it and began to give it to the disciples. So he takes this bread, and we know that it was unleavened bread because it was the first day of unleavened bread was uh, was uh, Thursday, and this is Thursday night, so that's the only kind of bread you've got is unleavened bread. Unleavened bread was uh, to be eaten at the Passover. It was a sign of the um, uh, fact that, that they had to leave in haste uh, for the Passover uh, to get out of the land of Egypt. You know, they ate with the originally that first night with their clothes on and their staff in their hand and ready to get the command to head out of Egypt. And uh, it also is a fit symbol because it is an emblem of um, leaven is associated with sin and corruption. And uh, so to represent Christ's body, it's a perfect figure to have unleavened bread. It, it, he is... Uh, an unleavened uh, body was a sinless body that we're remembering. So it fits in, in that way as well. So it is a, a symbol of purity. Um, and Jesus had a pure, perfect body. And it's perfectly suitable having unleavened bread uh, to represent his body. And again, we want to do things just the way the Lord set it up in the beginning. We don't want to add to it or change it or do anything other than what we know pleases the Lord. And when he set it up, he used the unleavened bread. So, so should we. And he said to them, this is my body. And of course we know there's all kinds, well, there's just millions of people around the world that take that as a miracle takes place when you give a blessing for the bread and it turns into the somehow or another the actual body of Christ is associated with that, whether it's uh, transubstantiation in the Catholic Church or uh, I guess the Lutheran Church, they have another idea where it's bread and the body kind of mixed together, <laughs> sort of like a sandwich. But that that's not the way this language is used in the Bible that Somebody's, you know, I'm sitting here, I say, this controller is my car. And when I drive my, <laughs> you know that this is not my car, right? This, that's a figure of speech. We, we talk like that, and the Bible talks that way all the time. In the parables, doesn't Jesus say about uh, the parable of the tares? Now, the tares are this, <laughs> and the wheat is that, and uh, the world is you know, the kingdom and so on. I mean, he, he uses this figure of speech all the time where one thing is representing something else. And that's what he's doing here with, the, with his bread. The bread, figuratively speaking, it, it represents my body to you, right? So you think about my body when you take this bread. And his body is sitting there at the table so you know um, 
if it was going to miraculously change into Christ's body some way, wouldn't his body, when he said that, have to disappear? <laughs> right? This is my body. Poof. He's gone and all's left is the bread. Because his body's sitting there at the table, and he's got the bread. Obviously, he's not literally talking about this is my body. His body is there. It represents my body and what I'm going to do at the cross. And uh, this, this idea is uh, nothing new here, but, uh, you know, a lot of things happen just a little bit at a time. People start, uh, you know, over the centuries, they get more and more mystical about the Lord's Supper and about it somehow the real presence of Christ's body is somehow associated with it and over the centuries, it turns into where it's a miracle when you take the Lord's Supper. Instead of being something you do to remember what Jesus did for us to give us a blessing, they turn it into an actual sacrifice that's going to bring you some kind of blessing right now, which that's not how it was intended in the beginning. Um, it's parallel to that Passover meal that they were having. That Passover lamb, what, what did it... What did it represent? Well, you have a lamb, you know, it's a thousand years later after the, after the original Passover. What did that lamb represent to the people when they ate it that night? What do you think? It went back to that first lamb, right? <laughs> it's pointing back to that first lamb when they took the blood and they put it on the doorpost and all that. It was a memorial to what happened back there in the beginning. That's what the Lord's Supper is, same thing. It's a memorial about what Jesus did on the cross for us. He gave his body and his blood for us. And uh, again, you wouldn't think you'd really have to put that much time into this, but we know we have so many friends and loved ones that are all around us that have confusion on this. Um, yes. Yeah, and it, he's... He's going to bless that fruit of the vine we're going to see, and it's still fruit of the vine. He calls it the fruit of the vine after he blesses it. So if it, if it automatically changes into the literal blood of Christ, he'd be saying, and this blood, <laughs> right, after that. But he doesn't. He still calls it fruit of the vine. So it doesn't trans, you know, form into something else. And he's, Paul tells us what it's for. Do this in remembrance of me. The Passover in Exodus 12 and verse 14 is called a memorial. Do this as a memorial. And we say the same thing about the Lord's Supper, right? This is a memorial feast to remind us what the Lord did. And isn't it, isn't it a wonderful uh, concept that Christ is the bread of life, Him giving His life for us, his, Him taking all that punishment upon His body that our, we deserve by His uh, His. Uh, scourging, we are healed, right? His sacrifice, paying the price for us, all of those things we think about in connection with that body, that bread, when we take it. All of us in the church, all over the world, there's one bread, Jesus Christ, right? That gave all of us spiritual life that nourishes us. So, I mean, it's wonderful spiritual things to be thinking about when you take the Lord's Supper. Uh, but we don't want to turn it, you know, we want to keep and it's not like, well, it doesn't mean much if it's not his real body. Yeah, it does. It means a great deal when you think about what that body is to us, and what it represents, and remembering everything it did for us. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. So he takes the grape juice that they have mingled with water there that was drunk at the Passover. And he uses that fruit of the vine in order to represent uh, his blood and make them think about his blood. So there's a, a, a cup or the cup that is taken. You never have the term wine that's used in connection with the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. Even though, I, I, as we've mentioned before, the word wine, oinos, is a word that uh, it just means any kind of you know fruit of the fruit of the vine or grape juice, whether it's fermented or unfermented, if you use the word wine. It's like, as we say, like the word water. It means salt water or fresh water. You have to look at the context to see what kind of water you're, you're talking about. Um, but it, it doesn't use the word wine anywhere. 
It uses fruit of the vine. And um, they have uh, an argument that's made sometimes in debate whether you can only use one container or, you know, he, he passed it out and they each had their own container, which is what they do with the Passover as far as history, what we see being done. That certainly sounds like what happened in the book of Luke. He took the cup and he said, share this among yourselves. Then he talks about the bread and then he comes back to the fruit of the vine after that and starts talking about it. Uh, but anyway, uh, whether the article is there or not there, most of the time it says the cup in the Greek in most of the all the contexts where you see it. And sometimes it'll say a cup. But in Greek, something is definite for sure if you have the, the, the article there, the. But even when it's not there, it's definite a lot of times. <laughs> it's just according to the context. And we see the used so many different places, even though it's not there, you can't assume that it was not talking about the cup and speaking about the contents of the cup by metonymy. It's talking about the fruit of the vine when it says that. And uh, again, you look up in the, it's not, not my idea, but it's a figure of speech. That's what the Greek dictionaries and lexicons say, that it's used by metonymy. Uh, the container is used for what's in it. We say you want to come over and have a cup of whatever. We don't mean just the cup. We're talking about what's in the cup when we say that, right? And Bibles talks the same way. It's talking about what's in the cup is what signifies his blood. The container doesn't have any significance attached to it. And again, he blessed it. He gave thanks. It's the cup of blessings which we bless. We, we give thanks for the cup. And when he had taken that cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. Uh, here's some more arguments on the fact that this was grape juice and wasn't intoxicating wine uh, from what I've been able to study about it. It uses the term, of course, uh, grape juice, non-intoxicating juice. Uh, Fruit of the vine used six times in the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament, the 70 or Septuagint. And it's, all, it's used those six times for the juice that's inside the grape. We know that's not intoxicating, right? actual grape juice. And so certainly the Talmud says when they had the Passover that they boiled the wine or they used wine fresh from the vat, uh, juice immediately expressed from the cluster for the Passover. Uh, so what Jesus had was grape juice. That's what they used. If it was fermented, just like the bread, you're not supposed to have any fermentation connected with the Passover or with any sacrifices altered to, offered to God. They didn't offer wine, alcoholic wine, to God. They used grape juice or uh, just juice when they did that. So no leaven was to be present at the Passover. Fermented wine is, from, uh, is a form of leaven, and we see in the Hebrew when they talk about uh, sweet bread, it's talking about unfermented bread uh, as used at the Passover. So it's unleavened, unfermented uh, wine or, or juice that's used. All leaven or fermentation was excluded from offerings to God. It extended uh, by the Jews to fermented wine or strong drink as well as to bread. They didn't use anything fermented. Uh, it, it had that symbolism attached to it of corruption and sin. And so they didn't use that in the sacrifices. Another uh, a Jewish scholar, Dr. Isaac, he says in a long passage, in the Holy Lands they do not commonly use fermented wines. Best wines are preserved sweet and unfermented in their feast for sacred purposes, including marriage feasts. Well, that would where, where Jesus turned the water into wine. This would go along. It was unfermented wine that Jesus used because that's what they used at the marriage feast. Now, they never used any kind of fermented drinks in oblations or libations. The use of fruit of the vine from fresh grapes or raisins, fermentation always was a symbol of corruption, decay, and rottenness. So all of that goes together with the idea they weren't using alcoholic wine. You know, I've heard of people um, having problems in some of the, uh, that are trying to get over alcoholism or whatever or even priests in the Catholic Church or whatever that are alcoholic, 
And the problem they have if they've got fermented grape juice that they're, they're going to fall off the wagon every time they go to services, right? That they're having to drink this to take the Lord's Supper. But it wasn't that way in the beginning. And it shouldn't be that way today. Uh, Jesus' blood was pure, sinless as the Lamb of God without blemish or spot. And that's what's given to for us. And uh, he says, drink ye all of it or out of it, this fruit of the vine. All of you drink of the fruit of the vine. And command for all of us, all, all disciples. So w when you used to go, you know, like to uh, Melissa's whole family's Catholic. So we've been to a lot of funerals and weddings and and well, they'll have the mass, you know, that we get to sit there and everybody else uh, does what they do. But it used to be just the priest would do the fruit of the vine, right? But what did Jesus say? All of you, everybody's to take of the fruit of the vine, not just the clergy as they, we're all clergy. <laughs> we're all God's people and we all partake of it. Uh, so share it among yourselves, it says in Luke twenty two seventeen. Anybody else have a thought on the, any of this? That, uh, yes. And, uh, you know, there's, there's lots, and uh, I have several books in my office on ancient wines and ancient winemaking and <laughs> what people drank. And we have a lot of idea that you just have this grape juice and no matter what you do, it's going to ferment. But that is not, they, they boiled it. They took the, they made their juice out of the raisins, which wouldn't have had any alcohol in it. They would do it that way. They boiled it down to a paste, just like we have Kool-Aid or whatever. They had that kind of thing in the first century. You could get the, whatever the, you know, dehydrated uh, grape juice you had and make some grape juice, just like we do. They had ways of, of hermetically sealing things to where it would not ferment. There's been shipwrecks that have been found in the Mediterranean Sea with all kinds of uh, uh, vessels, you know, these, uh, what do you call them, uh, these pots that they would put the wine in and seal them. And they haven't been contaminated even today. They dig them up and it's still, you know, uncontaminated, unfermented. It was sealed. Just like with that uh, ointment that Mary anointed Jesus with, they knew how to put it in a vial and seal it to where the, nothing could get in or out. And they could do the same thing with uh, fruit of the vine. They could do the same thing with it. So anyway, it, it's just wrong to think, well, it, it, obviously it was alcoholic. There's nothing you could do about it. Well, that's not true. They had a lot of ways to do that. The things get corrupted because the yeast gets in the grape juice, right? And then it starts turning the sugar in the grape juice into alcohol. That's one of the byproducts. Well, if you can strain out the yeast, they would do that. They had, they had uh, claws and things they would strain the grape juice through to get the yeast out of it before they sealed it up. So all of this is recorded in history for us, that, they, that this is the truth, that they knew how to do those kind of things. They knew what alcohol does to people, and they wanted to avoid that. Uh, many people did. You know, they didn't want to be drunk every time they had a meal or whatever, right? And uh, another thing, I guess, while we're talking about wine is talk about fortifying wine. I think wine you can get to like, and you read books about winemaking and it tells you, you know, you got to get the temperature exactly right. If it's too cold, it won't ferment. And if it's too hot, it won't ferment. So there's this real art involved in making this wine fortified the way people want to drink it and so on. And uh, so you have control over that. We'll keep it cold, right? And then it won't ferment or boil it and make it hot and it won't. So there's ways to avoid that. Anyway, probably too much time on that, but <laughs> there you go. Uh, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. So the blood also, the fruit of the vine, is my blood. Not literally my blood, it represents my blood, and it re represents the blood of the covenant. Uh, to have a covenant, you had to have blood. That's the way it was in the Old Testament. It's what sealed the contract between you and God. If you're a sinner and you're wanting to enter into fellowship and a contract with God, He's not going to have anything to do with you and your sins. You've got to have a sacrifice for your sins to be able to come into a covenant with God, right? To have a union with Him. And so when they had the Old Covenant, 
everything had to be cleansed with blood and dedicated with blood, cleansed from sin so that it could be put into effect. Exodus 24, he took the blood, he sprinkled the people, sprinkled the book, sprinkled the altar and the tabernacle and, all, and the priest. They had to go through an elaborate thing with blood. And then every year on the Day of Atonement, they went in and redid it, right? They had to get cleansed all over for the next year so they could stay in fellowship with God. So what's the blood where we sinners can get in a contract with God? Jesus' blood. <laughs> And it's the real blood. I mean, it's the one that's got the real power. The other was just, you know, uh, a substitute or a foreshadowing until the real blood came, right? All that Old Testament animal blood. They were just being really forgiven on an IOU, right? Because the actual, you're offering something that actually can't take away sin, but God accepted it when you offered it by faith because he was going to pay for it later. Right with Jesus, but so we got the blood of the covenant. So what do you think of when you take the Lord's Supper? You think about my contract with God. The reason I can be here and be called a Christian and a child of God, and have all the blessings associated with the New Testament, is because Jesus died for me. That's what I you think of when you take that fruit of the vine. He gave His life's blood for for me and you and everyone that we might have that. So every covenant has to have that blood. Every, every will, the Hebrew writer said, there has to be a death take place for that will to go into effect, right? Old Testament was that way. The New Testament could not happen without Jesus shedding his blood. So that no, no contract, no, no, no forgiveness, no inheriting all the things that we want uh, without that blood. So the Old Covenant, they... They had the promise of the land of Canaan, and Jesus, according to the flesh, was going to come someday. Well, what do we get? We get forgiveness of our sins in the new covenant. We have a hope of heaven as our home. We have uh, be with Christ in glory someday. We can be Christians, right, and be, have our citizenship there now. That we have that to look forward to. Uh, so. You couldn't have that covenant without that blood. So think of that when you take the Lord's Supper. It's the new covenant connected with Jesus' blood. And uh, without that blood, there is no forgiveness, no fellowship, the Hebrew writer says. Um, anybody else want to add anything on the blood? His life is in the blood. <laughs> That's what makes the blood so important. His life for our life. It's what makes it cleanse from sin. So, so uh, you know that they had that that blood to cleanse all of the different parts of you know they worshipped with it. We have Christ's blood that makes our worship work, right? With better blood, our way has been cleansed. So, um, what a blessing! What a thing! What a lot to think about when you think about that blood. That is a yeah, indeed. Uh, that you can have a relationship with deity. Uh, he says it is for forgiveness. The word ace there, uh, it's used 1,700 times in the New Testament, that preposition. It means into or toward or for or to enter into. It's to enter into forgiveness. It's to get that forgiveness that Christ has come to give us is uh, what that blood does. It's the blood that makes you clean. When you're baptized, it's the blood that cleanses you when you're baptized, not the water that does it. You're simply meeting the condition the Lord set on getting that blood applied to you. It's, your hearts are sprinkled with that blood, is what we're, the figure is given when we're baptized. Um, it's the blood that is for the forgiveness or pardoning of sin, the remission of the penalty that we were under. Uh, the blood is shed for that, and it's sprinkled upon us uh, when we're baptized. We're baptized into his death, what his death was about and for. And... Uh, of course, that same expression, this is a good verse to go through if someone's trying to teach Acts 2.38, you're baptized, you repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. It's the exact same phrase in Greek and in English too that's used here. And not because you want your, your sins are already forgiven, no. 
It's for in order to get that forgiveness. That's why you're being baptized. That's why you're repenting, to get that forgiveness. Why was the blood shed? To get the forgiveness. That's what it's for. So it's a good parallel verse to show people. That, that's what that expression means. Um, and he says it is poured out. And he's speaking uh, of what is going to happen the next day, really, right? <laughs> Before the day's over, it's going to be poured out as if it's already happened. He's, he's setting up this memorial about something that's going to happen at the cross the next day. But it is being poured out. I guess the wheels are already turning. We're already heading to that place. Judas has already left the room to go get the enemies and meet us in the garden, you know, and that's going to, uh, it's already started. That He's going to pour out his blood. And it's going to be poured out for many. And many means everybody. <laughs> all, because in other passages we're told that he shed his blood for all. All right. So why we emphasize that? Because some people that believe in a limited atonement in Calvinism, they say Jesus only died and shed his blood for the elect. He didn't shed his blood for everybody, right? But he shed his blood for everybody. That's who he died for. Now, whether we take advantage of it, it's up to us. But the blood is available for everybody if they will come to Christ. And many just emphasizes it's a great, number, right, for many. But other passages just say all. Every single individual that blood was shed for. So that anybody, uh, whosoever will, can come take of that blood. But you've got to want to. You know, it's not going to be forced on you. Uh, so both, both expressions are true. And then he says, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And there's a future drinking of the fruit of the vine. I don't, again, I, he's not speaking uh, literally, I don't think, when he's talking about drinking of the fruit of the vine. It's, a, it's figurative for the communion that we have with Christ in the Lord's Supper. And... I suppose that also foreshadows the heavenly feast that, you know, in the, in the consummation of the kingdom. But I think he's talking about in a new, fresh way, I'm going to take it. Not like we're eating it, having it here at the Passover. It's going to be a spiritual feast that we have with Christ, communion with Him. When we take the Lord's Supper, it says in uh, the Greek lexicons, they say on kainos, the word new there, in this context, new as respects form, recently made, fresh, recent, unused, unworn. New, which as recently made is superior to that which succeeds it. So it's new and better the way I'm going to take the fruit of the vine with you in the future. And then they say a new method of drinking. It's new in the sense that we're having the Lord's Supper. We're having a spiritual communion with Christ in the church, in the kingdom. And uh, it says, until that day, well, that day is the day when the kingdom comes. Well, after the day of Pentecost, we're told they were breaking bread and having fellowship, and they were having that communion with Christ. In Luke twenty two eighteen, it says, For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Well, when did the kingdom of God come? It came on the Lord's day, right? And he tells them, I'm going to... I'm going to sit with you at the table, right? Well, where's the table? The table of the Lord's in the church. It's in the kingdom. That's where we have the table of the Lord. So it predicts his uh, death, and it also uh, shows that uh, we're going to have this means of remembering the Lord when we meet together in the church. Is that the first bell? Right? <laughs> I'm always confused. Now, I, I don't hear them. I guess when everybody starts coming in the door, I'll know it was the second one. <laughs> so, uh, so at the end of the meal, it says, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So we know in John's gospel that there is a lot of teaching went on besides this that John tells us about. All of 12 up through chapter 16 is all there in the upper room and he's talking to him about the coming of the Holy Spirit and keeping the new commandment and all kinds of different things that are mentioned there uh, that Luke 
uh, that John adds for us, tells us about. But here in the first three Gospels, they t he institutes the Lord's Supper and you go right to the garden afterwards. Um, they sang a hymn, they sang a hymn, and we're told at the Passover they would sing Psalms 113 through 118, called it the Hellel. Um, that were some praises and hymns that were sung to uh, celebrate, you know, the exodus and salvation. And here, uh, one writer said, in the shadow of the cross, it didn't quench their spirit of praise. Jesus is talking about his death and his blood being poured out and all of that, and yet they sing a song of praise to God when they're getting ready to leave. didn't take away their joy from the Lord. Uh, he's still praising God. And here you have the only example in the life of Christ of uh, worship in, as far as music is concerned, and it is a cappella singing, just like in all of the passages after this, that it's uh, unaccompanied singing that is talked about. Simple, informal, spiritual, offering up praise and encouragement and teaching is what our singing is about. And you see the same thing here with the the disciples there with Jesus in the in the upper room before they left. And then they have their departure uh, from there. And as far as we know, they didn't stay in Jerusalem when Jesus was there. They'd always go to Bethany or they would go outside the city. They didn't have a place to, that would, they would stay in the city. Kind of dangerous with the enemies trying to take you and everything. They went outside the city. We know they went to the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas knew where they were going. So he was able to this night betray him over to his enemies, which otherwise they wouldn't have known where he was at. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. So here we have some more shocking news. Um, this is interesting as you look at the different accounts in the Gospels of Jesus talking about this and then Peter's denial that it, uh, some of the Gospels it's before they leave is, is the order and then you have in Matthew after they leave. So I, some say he taught about it, you know, <laughs> while right after the supper before they left and then he also talks about it on the way to the garden that he taught they have this conversation. Um, could just be that, you know, it's not following strict chrono chronological order in Matthew, maybe. He said it before they left, and he just tells us about it here. But this is something he said that night and made clear to them that you are all going to fall away. How would you like it if I said that to all of you tonight? <laughs> You're all going to fall away. Would you be shocked? Say, we're all going to stumble? That's what Jesus says. You're all going to fall. And who was right? They're going to, they're going to end up denying it, but Jesus said, you're all going to fall away. And it's the word for stumble there. You're all going to stumble. All right? You're all going to uh, desert me. That's what they're going to do. They're going to take off and flee. And they, I'm sure they're shocked by it, but Jesus is telling them again, he's showing, I'm the son of God and I'm telling you, I know you better than you know yourself. And you're all going to stumble tonight because of what's going to happen. And they can't imagine what would make them stumble. Peter's going to deny it vehemently that he would ever do such a thing. But who knew Peter better, Peter or Jesus? <laughs> Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. Anyway, we'll, Lord willing, we'll come back. I'll be on vacation next week, but uh, hopefully the week after that we can come back.